Hello dear viewers, welcome to the program Everything Catholic. That's your favorite program where we talk about everything as long as it is Catholic. Today we are continuing our discussion on the sacrament of matrimony with particular focus on matrimonial consent. My name is Father Silvanus Ame and I welcome you to the program. And as usual, my brother here is here with me. Reverend Father Boniface, Naval, welcome. So, joining with us in the discussion on the topic of matrimonial consent is a renowned professor of canon law and a lecturer about, on the same course for the past 15 years in the National Missionary Seminary of St. Paul, a member of the Abuja Metropolitan Tribunal for the last nine years, and in the tribunal, She's defender of the bond and protector of justice. justice yeah. And she is Reverend Sister Josephine Mwogugu, a member of the Congregation of the Holy Family Sisters of the Needy. Sister, you are most welcome to the program. Thank you, Father. Welcome, Sister. Thank you. Yes. So, um, with Sister's wealth of experience, you'll be sharing with us loads and loads of knowledge on matrimonial consent. So, sister, to begin with, canon law says consent is what makes a marriage. Uh, so, it is the exchange of it that establishes the marriage bond. So, let's begin by asking, what is this thing called consent? And why is the sacrament of marriage dependent on it? Matrimonial consent according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, is an act of the will by which a man and a woman, through an irrevocable covenant, mutually give and accept each other in order to establish a marriage. Okay. And when consent is not legitimately manifested by the bride and the bridegroom, marriage does not come into existence. Okay. If the bride or the bridegroom or both the bride and the bridegroom are not legally qualified to place the marital consent okay. that will make marriage, marriage will not be established. Okay. And if the manifested consent is effective, marriage also will not come into existence. Okay. So consent is so indispensable in the establishment of marriage that it is said without marriage, without consent, consent yeah. or if the consent is defective, that there is no marriage. Okay. And for the matrimonial consent to be this efficient cause of marriage, it must be free in all its entirety. Okay. It must be genuine, it must be sincere, it must also be mature. Mm -hmm. It must be enlightened in order okay. to make this possibility of Marriage. Marriage. Okay, marriage. <coughs> All right, so any manipulation of marital consent render will render the consent defective and okay. marriage will eventually be invalid. Okay, sorry, sister. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you have given a very uh, beautiful understanding of what matrimonial consent is and how it is very, very central and indispensable to, to the sacrament of marriage. Mm -hmm. You will be talking about defective consent, defective consent. Now, how can a defective consent be discovered? And But first of all, what is the only defective consent in itself? Yeah. Okay. What does it imply? When I said that mm. uh, matrimonial consent must be free. Okay. Uh -huh. So, if matrimonial consent <laughs> is not free, if it is not enlightened enough informed you mean informed enough uh -huh. if it is not sincere enough 
it is falsified, all that can contribute to the defectiveness of matrimonial consent. Okay, invariably one can say that you say yes, but you mean no. Yes. Wow. Mm. Okay. So there are factors, of course, in canon law and in church's legislation yes. uh, that portray this defectiveness, okay. this of defect consent. Yeah. of consent. So basically, you are saying that consent that is given that has some um, basic elements lacking is what is referred to as defective consent. Okay, sister, thank you for that. Now, um, let's ask a, a, another fundamental question. Who is capable and who is incapable of giving matrimonial consent? Can anybody exchange consent? Or is there something that renders someone incapable of giving conscience, uh, consent? Sorry. And possibly incapable of receiving as well. Naturally, yes. naturally, uh, every human being has a right to marriage. Yes. Okay. Fundamentally. That is the fundamental law of nature. <coughs> but of course, the freedom is also limited in the sense that there are certain factors, there are certain conditions that a human being will find himself or herself. And that condition will render this person unqualified to enter into marriage. So, while the church upholds the right to marriage, the church also prohibits marriage when certain conditions are not met when certain qualifications are not there. Mm. Okay. Okay. So can you give us some instances, some instances. of some categories instances. of uh, persons or circumstances that will render someone incapable or unqualified to give or receive consent? Okay. Talking about the capacity to enter into that covenant called marriage, we will consult the church legislations found mm. in the Code of Canon Law. To, to be precise, Canon 1095. Okay. Okay. There are three categories of persons there who are said to be unqualified to enter into that covenant of marriage. Called marriage. Okay. Number one category are those who lack sufficient use of, use of reason. This lack of sufficient use of reason could be actual in the sense that this person at this moment lack sufficient use of reason because of drunkenness, because of substance abuse, mm. drug so addiction. Influence. So it is actual at the moment of the celebration of marriage. This person is drunk. This person is not in full control of his faculties. Okay. Wow. And is unable to place this matrimonial consent okay. that will bring about marriage. marriage. It can also be habitual in the sense that this person normally lack. This person habitually lack this sufficient use of reason and it's because of due to an illness of the mind mm. you understand uh, like it, could be, it could be insanity, insanity it could be depression mm -hmm. okay. but because of this condition this person is habitually not okay. able to place consent so, um, okay. what about clerics? Mm -hmm. Clerics are religious. Do they fall into this category of persons to who are incapable of Capable giving, of giving consent. consent? Well, if you are talking about consent here, a cleric who is fit, you understand? Uh, but when you talk about clerics and 
religious, they are dragging us to impediments. Okay. 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 Yeah, impediments. Okay. Impediments okay. to marriage. Uh, which okay. is different from consent. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. Right. So uh -huh. by that purview we can still answer that. That a cleric because he already has the bond of holy orders. Is prohibited by law to enter into marriage. So that is a difficult impediment because of his condition as a cleric. The same thing applies to religious the vow of justice. So it is an impediment for these two to attempt marriage. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sister. I want to ask very quickly on you know, the reasons why people go into marriage. If you ask people, they will give you a lot of reasons. You know, are there in any way that these reasons that people enter marriage could possibly influence the giving of their consent? Mm -hmm. And what happens in that sort of situation? Yeah. Maybe, uh, for instance, one sees a lady because he, she is rich, and of course he is managing life at the moment. And because of that material reason, you want to go into marriage, you know, with that person. But later on, you discover that it becomes very dramatic along the line, even if they say in the name of love, this marriage has been contracted, consent was given and all of that. Mm. Later on, the guy begins to withdraw that. Mm. He was not sure what he was doing. Okay. So how do we classify that? So that's why I say, are there possible cases of, mm. you know, reasons for marriage influencing the giving of consent? What do you say? Sure. Because um, some reasons, just like I told you, are not sincere reasons, yeah. mm -hmm. sincere enough to produce a clean and pure consent. And you said consent must be sincere, is that yes. it? Yes, it's not sincere, it must be pure, it mm -hmm. must be genuine. Uh -huh. So, a person who, because of material uh, appearance or material wealth, uh, tries to exchange consent with the other, is doing that fraudulently. Mm -hmm. And that is called the six. Okay. That is all the six. The canon law describes that or at least that in canon ten ninety eight six. Mm -hmm. uh, and if this person, because of this material wealth, without any base, without any genuine love, yeah. um, enters into marriage. You see that that marriage is not built on genuine consent. Mm. Uh, that consent is defective okay. good. and will produce an invalid marriage. Oh, good. Okay, we will um, hang it on that note and go on a very short break. When we come back, we shall continue. The discussion is on matrimonial consent, yeah. and we have Sister Josephine Uwagugu, Holy Family Sister of the Needy, sharing with us from a wealth of experience in canon law on the subject on that discussion today. Don't go away. Please stay with us. Everything Catholic, a program that discusses anything and everything about the Catholic Church. Faith, doctrines, morals, canon law, church governance, papal documents, you name it. As long as it is Catholic, it shall be discussed. Join Father Amir Sivanus and Father Nabo Boniface, two priests passionate about teaching the true faith of the Catholic Church as their host bishops, priests, religious and distinguished laymen and women to discuss and simplify the wealth of the church's teachings. Everything Catholic, showing on Catholic television, CTV. Everything Catholic, teaching the faith. Welcome back to the program, Everything Catholic. We've been having a very interesting discussion on matrimonial consent with Reverend Sister Josephine Mwagogu, Professor of Canon Law, at the National Missionary Seminary of St. Paul, Babalada, Abuja, Nigeria. And um, before we left off for the break, Sister had just explained to us uh, what happens when someone gives defective consent, uh, consent for a, a wrong reason, entering into marriage. And now I'd like to um, take a step further. We've talked about uh, reasons why <clears throat> someone may be rendered incapable 
of giving or receiving consent. consent. Yeah. But um, I'd like you to shed more light on lack of due discretion as one of the factors also that affects um, the validity of matrimonial consent. How is this to be determined? And um, how does it incapacitate or invalidate consent that is already given? Okay. <clears throat> Grave lack of decisionary judgments okay. with regard to marriage. So it has to do with one who is incapable of critically evaluating the nature of marriage, evaluating the covenant of marriage which he or she is about to enter. And uh, the conditions could as well be personality, personality disorders, uh, some other psychosis, neurosis, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. psychological uh, problems that will render this person unable to grasp the nature and the meaning of marriage. So, if this person who is about to enter into marriage is, un is unable to critically evaluate what marriage is and able to make a choice, because it's only when you're able to evaluate what something is, then you're able to choose. Whether you want it or not. Whether you want it or not. Okay. So if this person is not able to do that, this person automatically is not qualified to enter into marriage. And, and that actually leads to the next one, one which is the inability to assume the essential obligations and rights of marriage. Because, because even when you are able to place the consent, if the consent is not equal to the object, you cannot consent to what you are not able to do. That's right. That's right. Let's say, for instance, a homosexual person, okay. lesbianism, dependency syndrome, alcoholism, drug addiction. Okay. All these conditions can render an individual when it has gone to a chronic nature, let's say a drug addict, mm. uh, it can render this individual incapable of assuming the essential obligations and rights of marriage. Even when you try to consent, you, just like I said, you cannot consent to what you cannot do. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Now, sister, that actually um, already begins, you know, the answer to the next question I was going to ask, following the provisions of Canon 1096, paragraph 1, saying that for matrimonial consent to exist, the contracting parties must be at least not ignorant that marriage is permanent, a permanent partnership between a man and a woman, or that the procreation of offspring by means of sexual cooperation. Now, apart from these other factors you have given, so, at what life stage can one be considered not to be ignorant of the demands or the nature of marriage as it relates to giving consent? Okay. Maybe reference to age and all of that. Canon law says after puberty, okay. it is presumed that at least one who is intending to enter marriage should be able to know that marriage involves some sexual cooperation between a man and a, and woman, a woman, and also is directed towards procreation, procreation and education of children. Mm. And that is why uh, the age for marriage, though placed at 16 for man and 14 for woman, is still uh, left open to different regions. To modify. To yeah. modify according to the local situation. Mm -hmm. Here in Nigeria, we follow the Child Rights Act mm -hmm. that says anybody, at least after 18, uh, is 
able to marry. Though so this right child right act or this uh, provision is not accepted in all the states. In the 36 states, it's only 23 states who have accepted this uh, provision. But of course, the church uh, respects um, that uh, maturity needed for marriage. So now, um, sister, when say two parties enter into marriage and then at a later time one says um i consented to this union not freely you know your opening uh, response to what consent is you said it is a free act of yeah. the will mm -hmm. so supposing someone comes up to say this marriage i entered into it was not i didn't freely give consent there was some kind of coercion yeah, from somewhere. What happens to such a union that has already been established, established. with consent that is presumed to have been valid? Okay. Of course, marriage enjoys the favor of law until it is proven otherwise. otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> force and fear, that is count 1103 which validates marriage as a, a factor that renders consent effective. As we already know, nobody can provide consent. No other human being can provide consent except the parties in marriage. But then, when this consent came as a pressure, as a force, it's as if it never came. You understand? Uh -huh. It's as if nothing really happened because mm. the will was not there. Because consent is an act of the of human the will. will. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, if there are sufficient and proven evidence that this really happened, uh -huh, the parties are encouraged to approach the tribunal. Okay. The parties are not capable to process that themselves on their own. On their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they have to go through the formalities yeah. of declaring that marriage null and void. Null and, void. Uh, and then authorizing them as people who are now free to enter into marriage before. Because, of course, if that was what really happened, there was no marriage from the inception. So okay. they, are now to give in, they are now encouraged to marry. To marry. Okay. okay, thank you very much, sister. So following this response, you get it again. You know, I love following you so that I'll have a better understanding. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is this technical word that is often used in this matrimonial, matrimonial palace or issues mm -hmm. around marriage yeah. in relation to consent. Maybe you explain it better or better break it down. It's a simulation of consent. of consent. What does it mean? And what yeah. does it involve? Okay. And how can it be discovered <coughs> or known? Okay. Yes. Okay. When you talk about simulation, it's the appearance of something that is not there. Oh. -ho. So hmm. they come to the church to celebrate their wedding and they say, I do. I do, I do, I do. Uh -huh and they pronounce their marital vows. But loudly. Mm -hmm. But then... And the church will now clap. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, we discover that pronouncing this I do, mm. I take you as my lawful husband or lawful wife. Right. Inside, hmm. they are not really pronouncing it. Hmm. They mean the opposite. They mean the opposite. Uh -huh. So, when that happens, that what this person appears to be saying is not, is not really what he or she means, then we talk about simulation. It could be a complete simulation okay. or partial, partial simulation. simulation. Uh -huh. In the complete simulation, that is a full simulation, the whole of marriage is excluded. 
I do, but that, let me just follow, follow, the follow the formalities. formalities. It's not as if I am marrying you, but because I have another reason. I need, need to, to get, get a, a green, green card for the exactly. United States of America. Uh, I need to be a minister because your, your father is a president. So if I marry you, he will make me a minister. So I have something else. Uh, it's not like I'm interested in this in marriage. marriage. So the whole of marriage is excluded. Mm. It is just, <coughs> let me follow this formality that, that is led before me. So uh -huh. Just but, seen as a means to an end, to yes, get something. Yes, yes, yes. But they can also exclude the essential elements mm. and properties of marriage, like unity, like uh, indissolubility, mm -hmm. like oh, fidelity, children. <coughs> mm, children. Uh -huh. the, for example, one may say, ah, which kind, which, because unity is that uh, the union of one mm -hmm. man or woman mm -hmm. to the exclusion of every yeah, other person. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. since yeah. I already yeah. have somebody, yeah. let yeah. me still yeah. use you officially. Yeah. I still yeah. keep the person yeah. I have. Mm -hmm. So, the unity. Yes. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Oh, let me just have a trial. If it doesn't work, bye bye. Indissolubility of marriage, the permanence of marriage is excluded. So that is partial simulation. That means, in essence, that human act of the will is not sincere. Mm, that's true. So when that happens, it's not even irrevocable because it's supposed to be irrevocable. But then when you excluding the solubility of marriage, the permanency of marriage, it becomes revocable. So, so based on all that you have said on this program, it means therefore that when consent is simulated, there, there was no marriage at all. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, sister. And that's the much we can okay. take your viewers on the program. Our time is up. We should continue. But um, we have to call it an end for this week. And we thank you for being a part of the program. It has been a very interesting discussion with Reverend Sister Josephine Nwo Gugu, Professor of Canon Law at the National Missionary Seminary of St. Paul, a member of the Abuja Metropolitan, Ecclesia, Metropolitan Tribunal, yeah. Marriage Tribunal. Thank you very much, Sister. We thank you for coming. May God bless you. Dear viewers, you. please keep a date with us next week. Do not forget to... Um, follow us on our social media handles as seen on your screen. And also, please send us your feedback, your comments, and we very much appreciate also your support. It has been Father Amir Silvanus and Father Boniface on the program as usual. Thank you, and see you next week.